This evening we're going to, um, well, just consider one, well, one truth contained in uh, Romans chapter 6 in verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but of course the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what I want us to see is that even though we are forgiven of all of our sins, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter whether or not we sin. It still matters a great deal. It matters to God. It should matter to us that we don't do anything dishonoring to Him nor do the things that we know deserve everlasting damnation. That's why the title of the sermon, Even One Sin, Why Even One Sin is Too Much, and we're really going to see two reasons. Uh, the first being, of course, that it deserves damnation, but the second one being that the practice of any one sin, the practice of that sin, would be enough to destroy us um, and will destroy us unless we repent of all of them. Now, we're going to see something of that in Romans chapter 6 as Paul describes for us what our lives should be like in Jesus Christ, how we should never yield the members of our body to, uh, to sin as, as instruments to carry out the desire of sin. But having died to sin, we should be yielding our members, using our bodies, using our faculties to serve the Lord, to do what He calls us to do. So let's begin by reading Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness." I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. 
for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Really, if we understood all that, then nothing more <laughs> needs to be said. But I think you see the point. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, then you have died with Christ to sin. And you have been raised again with him to life. Now to live not for yourselves, not for sin, not to yield yourself to sin any longer, but to yield yourself to God, to serve him. But again, what I want you to see here is basically the summary of what Paul says in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's what death deserves. That's what you earn when you sin. And that includes any sin and every sin, not just the greatest sin, but also the least sin. It all deserves death. And that is the reason why we should avoid it as believers, even though those sins are forgiven. We don't trade on grace, as Paul says at the beginning. What then shall we Shall we sin so that grace may increase? If God glorifies himself through the forgiving of our sins, why don't we just sin it up so God can glorify himself even more by forgiving us? No, we've died to sin, and we can no longer live in it. And the wages of sin is still death. So let that be an encouragement to us to take sin seriously and, and help us to understand why it is that there are those within the church uh, the books we have in the library are full of their testimony, why it is there were those who were so careful to avoid every single sin they possibly could. That's what we need to be doing as well. Now, what I'd like to do is use this topic basically to, um, to continue somewhat, maybe to, um, to finish up uh, the idea that we were looking at in Psalm 119, at least to add to it. Remember that we had looked in Psalm 119 uh, to see what blessings we might be able to expect uh, for obeying the law of God, for doing what, the, what it is the Lord calls us to do. Uh, the law of God, as we know, shows us how to love God, and certainly He is, he is uh, worthy to be loved because of all that He's done for us, because of all the love He has shown for us or to us. It also shows us how we are to love our neighbor. But Psalm 119 goes on to tell us also what we can expect God to do for us by way of positive incentive for keeping that law. The many blessings, and I'm not going to try to rehearse what all of those things were, but let's just say the psalmist was in danger. He was in trouble. He was surrounded by his enemies, but he had clung to the Lord. He had served the Lord, not perfectly, but to the point where he looked to the Lord and expected God to deliver him because that's what God had promised to those who actually love him and serve him. And there were many other blessings in there as well. Now again, all of these were positive reasons, you know, reasons why we should obey the Lord because there's a great deal in it, as it were, for us uh, in a very positive sense. There are many, many blessings. Besides the fact, of course, that that's really what we want to do, because the Spirit of God lives in us. But there are other reasons why we should obey God as well. Uh, some reasons that we might consider a bit more on the negative side, even though we need to understand that God gives them to us meaning in, in a, in a well-meant way. Uh, certainly, He does want to strike the fear of the Lord in our hearts, but he, he does that for a good reason so that we will turn away from sin, so that we will do what is right, so that we will receive the blessing. There are, he tells us, consequences for disobedience. And that's what we want to look at. What are those consequences? Now let me just begin by saying that if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, if you have... Um, Turn from your sins, which is the evidence that you are trusting Jesus. And it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus, but if your life doesn't change, those words are meaningless, right? There has to be the obedience that follows. There has to be that sanctification. Well, if you've trusted Jesus and you know that you have because your life has changed, then you know that all of your guilt, all of your sin has been forgiven. You know that the Lord is going to bring you safely into heaven. But sometimes that fact that all of our sins are forgiven has the tendency to make us take sin 
lightly, uh, far too lightly, to make us think that it no longer matters. Now, why, why do we think that? Well, we know that from our own personal experience, don't we? But we've also just read in the sixth chapter of Romans that the Romans were also having that tendency, thinking, well, again, if, if my sinning gives glory to God because he can glorify his grace by forgiving me when I sin, then why not sin more so that God can glorify himself more? We well, see the fact that he is glorified by forgiving us should never be used as an excuse to sin. Again, I remind you what he says in verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. And by the way, may it never be is the strongest way that can be said in the Greek to push it into the realm of the impossible. May this never happen. May we never even begin to think that way because how shall we who died to sin still live in it? We're dead to sin. We can't continue in sin. Paul actually wrote earlier in chapter 3 that, that both he and his companions were actually being accused of teaching that very thing. In chapter 3, verse 8, he says, And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is is just. No, Paul wasn't teaching let sin so that God can glorify his grace. He was saying you've died to sin. No longer sin. No longer yield your, your instruments, uh, the, your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. Uh, you don't need to sin on purpose to give God the opportunity to glorify his grace in forgiving because you'll have plenty of opportunities. You'll provide plenty in your life without trying to do it. You are not to do evil so that good will come of it. If you have died with Christ to sin, if you have been buried with him, which you have if you've trusted Jesus Christ, you can no longer live in sin. Now, why is that the case? Well, there's, there's many reasons, of course, many answers to that question. But this evening, I want to focus on just one. And that is because you realize, as a Christian, that allowing even one sin in your life is too much. Now, why is even one sin too much? Again, there could be several reasons for that, but let me just give you two this evening. First of all, because every sin, even the very least sin, deserves eternal punishment. Secondly, and something that you've heard before if you've been here for very long, but something I haven't actually brought up in a while, but which is true, and we need to, to be very careful that we understand this, because any sin that you allow in your life, even the smallest sin that you don't repent of, can destroy you forever. Now, it can't destroy a true Christian, and we're going to see that, but there are people who believe that they are Christians, who in fact aren't Christians because they allow the practice of sin in their life. So any one sin not repented of can destroy you and that's why you should not allow even one in your life. So let's first of all consider this. As a Christian, you know that even one sin is too much because every sin, even the least sin, deserves eternal punishment. Thankfully, we're not going to have to see that if we've trusted Jesus Christ, but it is true. We will see it in the lives of others who haven't. Now, again, let me just begin by saying that if you are a believer, if you've taken Jesus at his word, if you're depending on him alone, on his righteousness alone to get you into heaven, if you are repenting, if you're turning from every sin, if you are fighting against every sin, then all your sins are forgiven. Every sin, everything you've done in the past that's sinful, everything that you may be presently struggling with or your, your faults and failures in the present, every sin you ever will commit in the future, they're all forgiven. Not one of them will ever condemn you. And of course, you and I should thank God for that because apart from his mercy, 
in sending his son, that never would have happened. Now I realize there is a passage of scripture that says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There is a condition there if we do this. But to, to understand that, we have to take into account that Jesus did in fact die for all of our sins. And I believe what John means by that is that if we are true believers and if our sins have been forgiven, we will continually be confessing our sins and repenting of them as we understand that we commit them. Because otherwise you have a situation where if I don't confess one sin and I die without that, then I'm going to be lost because when one sin is all it takes to condemn me. Now if Jesus has saved you, that he has forgiven all of your sins. But the evidence that he has is you will be repenting of all your sins. You will be confessing all your sins. Not just some, but all. But again, let's not let the fact that all these sins are forgiven. Every, every single sin. Let, let's not let that make us forget that even though they are forgiven, that they still deserve, even the smallest of them, still deserves condemnation. It would outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, it's true that Jesus paid for them. His death on the cross is enough. His death on the cross is more than enough, infinitely enough, to wash all your guilt away. But apart from Jesus Christ, every single sin that you commit, again, even the least of them, even something as simple as a word that is spoken you know, uh, let's just say a wrong word that is spoken, one word that, uh, that you haven't thought through its consequences, even a single word that is spoken inappropriately, Jesus says is enough to condemn you. He says in Matthew 12, 36, but I tell you that every careless word, and that is a word that, that you speak that you haven't thought through, and one that I uh, would understand as being sinful. I tell you that every careless word that people speak they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Don't forget, as we've already seen in our meditation this evening, that all it took to condemn the whole human race to everlasting destruction was the simple disobeying of a single command. Again, our meditation in Romans 5, verses 18 through 19. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. I believe that one act is referring to the cross. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. You see, there was one commandment that was broken, that destroyed all of us. And what was that command that Adam disobeyed? Of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat. Actually, this is Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. But why not eat of this tree? I mean, what was the big deal? The eating of this fruit seems like a relatively small thing if you were to compare it to adultery or to murder. You know, I think that when Adam and Eve looked at that tree, I don't think there was anything unique about that tree. There was nothing special. It didn't have golden fruit on it. Uh, it wasn't, you know, something that just stood out. It was simply a tree that God singled out that probably looked like the other trees in the garden. And the question might arise, why not this tree, Lord? Why not this tree? It looks like all the other trees. Maybe the fruit's good. Uh, why can't I eat of this tree? It seems like such a small thing. What was the problem? Why was the breaking of that one command enough to condemn all of us? Well, it's because of the one that that sin was committed against, the infinitely holy God. Now, eating from a tree is a relatively minor thing. Unless God says, don't do it, then it becomes a major thing. Now, what about the sins that you and I have committed? Are they any less serious than the one that, that Adam committed? I mean, has God changed? Is God any less worthy than he was before? No, he hasn't changed. He's still infinitely worthy. Has God changed his standard? Is he, is he no longer holy? Is it okay now just to do whatever you want to do? No, God still hates sin. 
So what, what has changed with regard to how God views sin and how serious it is? Nothing. Nothing's changed. Every sin still deserves what the sin that Adam committed deserves, except, of course, when he sinned, he sinned as our representative. Every sin still deserves death. The wages of sin is death. And by death, that doesn't mean physical death, although physical death is, is a part of that, but it refers to eternal death. It refers to judicial death, the condemnation of death. It refers to eternal punishment in hell at the hands of our holy God, which is why you and I should never take the breaking of any one of his commandments lightly. Now, in light of this, do you allow sin in your life? If, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd all have to admit that there are times when we do this, but should we do this? Should we ever allow sin in our lives? Of course not. Because it, for a variety of reasons, certainly it dishonors God, it dishonors Christ who died on the cross for all those things, but remember what that deserves and remember what would have happened to you if Jesus had not died on the cross. God still hates those sins. One sin is still too much. But what about those of you who have never trusted Jesus Christ? If the breaking of just one commandment deserves everlasting punishment, how much more all the sins that you have committed? Now again, listen to this. Adam sinned and the whole human race was plunged into misery and many millions, many billions of people have either gone to hell or will go to hell because of that one sin. And you will go to hell for your sins unless you trust Jesus. If you're wise, let that fact drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it turn you away from your disobedience and place your whole hope of heaven on Jesus Christ. Jesus stands offering himself to you as a savior. But you have to turn from your sins and you have to trust him. Otherwise, these words, these truths will do you no good at all. But if you will trust him, he will forgive you. The Lord says through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 55 verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. You know, there was a meeting a number of years ago that um, uh, this denomination perhaps is a little bit more aware of than, and perhaps many denominations aren't even aware that even e ever took place, but it was called uh, the Westminster Assembly, a meeting of, of actually more than 100 um, ministers and professors uh, from their seminaries and universities who got together to formulate a confession that would unite the church uh, in all the different countries that were represented there. And uh, they realized what it is we're talking about here. And they summarized it very well in this particular section of the Confession, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 15, verse 4. This, I think we would do well uh, to memorize this, very short. They, they wrote this, As there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. I hope you can see the balance between those two things. They see what sin deserves, but they also see what Jesus has done to deal with it. If you repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ, nothing you have done will condemn you. You will be forgiven. You will be set free. But you do have to repent. You do have to trust in Jesus Christ. If you do, you will be saved. But now let's move on to the second reason why even one sin is too much, and that's because any sin that you don't repent of, any sin that you allow in your life, even the smallest sin, can destroy you if you don't repent of it. I want you to notice there was an if in what Westminster said. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. You do have to repent if you're going to be forgiven. 
There's a reason God wants you to obey. There's a reason he wants you to repent of your sins. We've just seen one. Every sin deserves damnation because every sin is committed against infinite holiness. But what happens if you repent of some sins but not others? What if you obey some of the commandments but not all? What if you hold on to one of your sins and you refuse to let it go? Now, I do want to uh, make sure we don't get any misunderstandings here because this can easily be misunderstood. Uh, I'm not asking the question, what if you continue to fall into sin? Okay, because we do that every single day. I mean, even if we do, by God's grace, manage to do what the Lord actually commands us to do, we always fall short in the motive department. None of us can actually do what the Lord calls us to do in the way we're supposed to do it, which is with pure love out for Him and a, a singular desire to give Him glory alone. Sadly, we ha all still have sin in our hearts, and that sin still injects itself into everything that we do, and that's why we need Jesus Christ as our mediator, because... What we do isn't acceptable even when we can manage to live up to the letter, as it were, of what he commands us to do. We still can't get the heart quite right because of the sin that's in our heart. So I'm not saying, I'm not asking the question here, uh, what if you continue to fall into sin? And nor am I asking the question, what if you continue to struggle with sin? Because if you're a believer, you do struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin every single day day. Paul writes in Galatians 5.17, the struggle that's going on within us. As a matter of fact, if we didn't have Christ in our hearts, we wouldn't have this struggle. We would just simply be giving ourselves to sin all the time. The struggle comes when the Spirit of God comes into your heart. Paul writes this, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So I'm not talking about, you know, uh, not asking the question whether you're struggling with sin or whether you sometimes fall into sin because we all struggle and we all stumble and we all fall. What I'm asking is this, or, or the point I'm making is this. What if there is a sin that you basically refuse to give up, that you don't struggle against? Any sin. Something you're doing that you know God forbids or something you're not doing which you know that he commands what if you're not fighting to put that particular sin off what if you're not fighting to put that particular duty on what if you're just perfectly happy with the situation as it is and you're you're content just to continue in that sin well what does that say about you well this is what we have to be aware of because that demonstrates that we don't know the Lord. John tells us that if we practice any sin, that we don't know him, and that is enough to destroy us, which is why I said if there's any, even the least sin we don't repent of, that sin can destroy us. Listen to what John says in 1 John 3, verses 2 through 9. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it is not yet as yet, uh, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. From what? From sin. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin. 
because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By the way, when it, sometimes it, it seems to be saying it's the practice of sin. Sometimes it seems to be saying it's just sinning. But in each case, the, 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 the idea is the same. Basically, it's the idea of, of continual ongoing sin or the practice of sin that is in view here. Now, as Christians, we all struggle to do what's right. As Christians, we are all tempted and we frequently fall into sin, hopefully not gross sin, but at least sins of the heart, sins of the mind. But if we are true believers, we continue to struggle against it because we love what is good and hate what is evil. We continue to get up when we fall. We want to obey. We want to overcome sin. We don't want to stay in it. And that's because we love God. That's because we love Jesus. That's because by His Spirit we want to be just like they are. Not just 10%, not just in some areas but not other areas, but in every possible area that we can be in all areas. So, if we love anything that is evil, if we want to do things that are wrong, something that God says is sin, if we don't hate that thing at all, whatever it may be, and we're perfectly content to continue in that sin, what does that say of us? Well, it not only says that we love sin, and we do have to be careful here because even as believers, we still have some love for sin and we wish it were gone, but it's sadly because sin is still in our hearts, we still have some desire for it. If we didn't, we wouldn't do it, right? So we have some desire for it. You don't do what you don't want to do. So you must have some want in your heart for it. It does tell us that we love sin, but if we practice sin, it says something else. It tells us that we really don't love what is right, at least not as we thought we did, because if we did love what was right, we would love what is right everywhere that it's found, in every form, in every application, and we would hate everything that's contrary to it. You know, when you love one thing, you, you have to hate its opposite because it's, it's a continuum, isn't it? If, if, I, if I love sin, I'm going to hate righteousness. If I love sin, I'm going to hate righteousness. I mean, it's... It, it, they're on a continuum, they're opposites of one another. Now, if there is a sin that we love so much that we have no intention of giving it up, we're just going to practice it, we're going to do it, that means we do not love its opposite righteous principle. We do not love righteousness. So, if we don't love what is right, we are going to practice what's wrong. If we practice what's wrong, John tells us here we're not born of God. And if we're not born of God, then we are going to be destroyed for our sins unless we repent. John says that if you are born of God, when once you come to see what it is that God requires in His Word, you will begin to try to do it. When you at once see that God forbids something, that you will begin struggling to stop doing that thing and put that thing off. Again, the love for righteousness is universal. If you love what is right, you will love everything that is right and you will hate everything that's wrong. That is the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Sadly, as I've already mentioned, the believer as well as the unbeliever still loves the things that are wrong. And the fact that that's there does not, as it were, knock us out of, of the con or the, the running as it were to, as to whether or not we're a Christian. But loving what is right is the key. That's what creates the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. If we had no desires of the spirit, we'd just simply give in to the flesh, there wouldn't be any struggle. When the spirit of God comes in, he gives us a love for what is right, and that love for what is right makes us hate what is wrong, even though in some respects we still love it. So in light of this, what is the state of your heart tonight? Is there a sin that you love? Is there a sin that you practice? One that you're not willing to fight against? One that you're not willing to put off? One that you're not willing to let go of? 
If that's the case with you, then you need to be very careful because that sin will destroy you unless you repent of it. Now listen again to what John writes in John, 1 John 3, I believe it is, first 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And then verses 7 and 8, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. And let me just add one more thing to this, that this is not only true of the sins that, that, we, that one might practice, that you might practice, that others can see, but it's even more particularly true of the sins that you might practice that others can't see. Uh, uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, this is in your bulletin, it's also on the screen, I hope. This is what he writes. He says, take heed of secret sins. They will undo you if loved and maintained. One moth may spoil the garment. One leak drown the ship. A penknife stab will kill a man as well as a sword. So one sin may damn the soul. Nay, there is more danger of a secret sin causing the miscarrying of the soul than open, open profaneness because not so obvious to the reproofs of the world. Therefore, take heed that secret sinnings eat not out good beginnings. I want you to notice he was talking, of course, about secret sins. If, if you do them openly, well, at least there's people who see it and you're going to be somewhat reluctant to do it. So at least there's some kind of help there against your sin to make you turn away from it. But secret sins that nobody else can see, well, those you can go on with. But he says, be careful, because even the least little sin, notice his illustrations, one moth, one little moth can destroy a garment. I think you've probably seen that happen. I've seen that happen. Only takes one leak to sink a ship. If you have a penknife, you can be killed by a penknife as, as well as a sword. A small thing as well as, as a great. One sin may damn the soul, but especially secret sins. So we need to be careful against every sin. Even one sin is, is too much. And again, the reason why God tells us that is because He's warning us because He wants us to turn from those sins and to turn to Him. So then lastly, what should you do if you should find yourself trapped by the power of even one sin? And by the way, if you're under the power of one sin, that doesn't mean you're just under the power of one sin. It means you're under the power of sin. It means you're in bondage to sin because really you love all sin, not just the one. Well, what do you do if you find that you're in bondage to sin? There's only one thing you can do. You have to go to Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can set you free from sin. You need to pray. And ask the Lord to break the power of that sin in your heart. Because only Jesus can give you the grace to turn from that sin and to put your trust in Him. He is the only one who can do that. Listen to what He says in John 8, verses 38 through 36. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Now he says a couple of things here. If you're practicing sin, if you're committing sin, you are the slave of sin. And if you're a slave, you're not going to be in his house forever. Okay, the slave doesn't abide in the house forever. The Son does. But if the Son frees you from sin, and only he can, you will be free indeed. So if you are bound by sin, realize you can't free yourself. Only Jesus can. You have to go to him and you have to ask him to set you free. And if that's your situation this evening, I would urge you to do that because you don't know when time is up. Even one sin can destroy you and we all have far more than that. Jesus is willing to take them all away if you will turn from them all and trust in him. Well, let's, um, let's bow in prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply this, to, to bring it home to our hearts, to make us feel it and to respond as we should to it.